If you take a ruler, hold it on one end, pull it back on the other end, and let go, the pulled back end will oscillate back and forth between those two points. This oscillation is what we refer to as simple harmonic motion. We can also describe this motion with a mass on a spring. If the spring has not been disturbed, it hangs as what is called the equilibrium position. When disturbed, the mass will oscillate back and forth to some height above equilibrium and some height below equilibrium. Both of these distances are referred to as the amplitude. If you were to observe this motion, you would see that the mass moves up and down from equilibrium at regular time intervals. This oscillation is called periodic motion, and there are a lot of things that we can measure about it. Since there is a regular motion associated with our oscillations, we can determine the rate at which the mass oscillates. This is called the frequency and has a unit of hertz. One hertz is simply one oscillation per second. If the mass is moving twice as fast, it would have a frequency of two hertz, and we could say that there are two oscillations per second. You could also describe the motion in terms of how long it takes for one oscillation to occur. This is called the period and has a unit of seconds. So if we go back to our one oscillation per second, it takes one second to complete one oscillation. We say it has a period of one second. Now if we have two oscillations per second, then it only takes a half a second to complete one oscillation. Therefore, the mass has a period of one half seconds. You may have noticed that the period is actually the inverse of the frequency. The reverse is also true, and the frequency is the inverse of the period. Suppose a medical imaging device produces ultrasound by oscillating with a period of 0 0.4 microseconds. What is the frequency? Well, the hard part here about this problem is that the time is given in microseconds. One microsecond is 10 to the negative sixth seconds, so all we have to do is add on our original given time. And since frequency is the inverse of the period, we can just divide 1 by 0 0.44 times 10 to the sixth to get 2.50 times 10 to the sixth hertz. Hmm. So the frequency of a middle C on a typical musical instrument is 264 hertz. What is the time for one complete oscillation? So this is the reverse of what we just did a minute ago. When asking for time, we really are looking for the period of the wave. Since we are given the frequency, we can take its inverse to find 3.79 times 10 to the negative third seconds. Now in order to describe oscillating motion, we need to define some positions. The equilibrium position is typically what we define as the zero point in our frame of reference. We can actually define the positive direction in whichever way we want, but we will define the positive x direction as the direction in which the spring is longer. This would mean that the negative direction is the direction in which the spring is shorter. If we were to look at a position time graph for this motion, we would see that it starts at position positive a, moves back towards zero, and on towards negative a. This position reverses and moves back toward equilibrium where it continues on towards positive a, and then back down, and so on. The displacement as a function of time can be described by taking the amplitude times the cosine of 2 pi, divided by the period times the time. Now the time it takes for one complete oscillation is the period. And when the time is equal to the period, our function tells us that we have just the cosine of 2 pi. The cosine of 2 pi is 0, which is equal to 1. So when the time is equal to the period, the position of our mass is back at A again. What if we had two periods? Well, our equation would end us with 4 pi, which again is the cosine of 0, or just 1, and we still end up back at position A. Really, any number that we put in as our time, that is a multiple of our period, will give us a cosine of some multiple of 2 pi, which will equal 1 and take our position back to A. Now here's something really sneaky as well. We have seen this 2 pi over t before. This is the expression for angular velocity. In this situation, we can call it angular frequency, and we can substitute omega in for the 2 pi over t. Omega still has the units of radians per second, or revolutions per second, and we can substitute omega in for the 2 pi over t in our position equation. Note that your book does not substitute in omega into this equation, but be aware that they are the same thing. Now let's look at this from a velocity standpoint. There is some calculus here that allows us to derive a velocity equation from our position equation. 
While I am not typically a huge fan of calculus, it does have its uses from time to time. So let's look at how we can determine this. We know that velocity is derived from an object's position with respect to the time it is moving. The position is derived from our previous description of a cosine times omega times time. Now this is all about derivatives, so we want the derivative of cosine, which is a negative sign. Part two of this step is to multiply the whole thing by omega. This is because the omega is the argument of the cosine expression, and when we changed cosine to the negative sign, we have to multiply by the derivative of the original argument. This gives us an equation of negative a omega times the sine of omega t. If we look a bit closer to our graph, we start at zero in this case because it is a sine function. And since it is negative, our graph will start in the negative direction. Notice that the period does not change just because we are talking about velocity instead of position. So one complete wave will be completed in the same amount of time as in our position graph. So I bet you saw this one coming. Now we want to look at acceleration. Acceleration is the derivative of the velocity in respect to time. We can use the equation we just derived and put in for that velocity. The derivative of sine is cosine, and again, we need to take the derivative of the sine's argument, which is omega. Acceleration is equal to negative amplitude omega squared times the cosine of omega t. I will remind you again here that omega is 2 pi divided by the period. You are free to substitute that in at any time, but you can probably see here why omega comes in handy when you need it most. Our graph is one of the cosines, so we will not start at zero, and it is a negative cosine, so we will start below equilibrium. Again, the period on this graph is the same as the period in our position and velocity graph, so one complete oscillation occurs in the same amount of time in all three graphs. So if we really look at our position, we are starting at amplitude a, and we are moving back towards zero. This makes sense because in our velocity graph, what we have is we have a negative velocity. Remember, if we are moving back toward our zero point, then we have a negative velocity. Since we have a negative velocity, that's a change in velocity. That is changing. Since we have a negative velocity that is changing, our acceleration is going back towards zero. As we move past that zero mark and our equilibrium point, we're moving back towards the other amplitude or the negative amplitude. This means in our velocity graph, we're going to be moving away from equilibrium. And again, at this point, if we, if we line up our graph right along in here, what we see is that our acceleration is going toward a maximum acceleration in this direction. So we can follow this position. We can talk about how our amplitude is moving back toward equilibrium, back toward the other amplitude, back toward equilibrium, and the other amplitude, and continuing that on. So we look at how that position changes. We can compare how the velocity is changing each time. And then we can compare how the acceleration is changing each time. Now remember this is a mass on a spring. Way back when, we defined Hooke's law as the net force on a spring equal to a negative k times x. k is the spring constant for that particular spring, and x is the length of the spring is displaced from equi e <laughs> equilibrium. Also way back when, we talked about force being equal to the mass times the acceleration. So we can set that equal to our spring constant and our displacement. So guess what you can do with that? <laughs> yeah, we can take the acceleration equation and the position equations we just derived for simple harmonic motion and substitute it in for the acceleration and position in this expression. So don't panic yet. We have cosine and omega t on both sides. We also have amplitude on both sides. That means we can pull those out of those expressions and cancel them out. And this is really cool because this equation does not have any unit referencing time. Time does not matter in this case, and neither does the amplitude. So the spring constant is just equal to the mass times omega squared. We can then write an equation for angular frequency using just the spring constant and the mass. This is actually kind of amazing when you think about it. For such a complicated motion, we can simply reduce it to this. So what this says is that the more mass you add to your spring, the more the angular frequency will decrease. Seems reasonable because if you have more mass, then it will make sense that it would take longer time to get back to where it started. If you have a larger spring constant, the restoring force is more, so it will return to its original position more quickly. Pretty elegant, don't you think? Oh, and you know what else? This is the equation for omega. So everywhere else that you use omega, guess what you can substitute in? All right, so that was a lot of math, so let's review a bit here, shall we? 
Frequency is the number of oscillations in one second. It is labeled in hertz. The period, t, is the time it takes for one oscillation to occur and is labeled in seconds. Frequency and period are the inverses of each other. Angular frequency describes a mass on a spring. It depends on the spring constant, which remember is unique to each spring, and it also depends on the mass that we attach to the spring. Frequency and angular frequency are closely related. 2 pi over the period is actually what defines omega, so we can relate the two. Actually, we didn't do this before, but we can also combine the two expressions for omega into one that is more descriptive of the period. So if we increase the mass, the time it takes to go back to the start point is increased. If we have a larger restoring force with a stronger spring, it will take less time to go back to the starting point. Makes a lot of sense, and we'll actually need this concept later on. We also have three equations to describe the motion of the oscillation. Position as a function of time is the amplitude times the cosine omega t. Hopefully you realize that omega is short for a couple of different things, and we could actually write that a bit differently. Notice these are the same equations, just instead of omega, we have the square root of the spring constant over the mass. We can do that because omega is equal to the square root of the spring constant over the mass. Velocity as a function of time is the negative amplitude times omega times the sine of omega t. Again, we make this much more fun by substituting away. So we have two omegas in our equation. We can again substitute in the square root of k over m. And finally, acceleration as a function of time is the negative amplitude times omega squared times the cosine of omega t. And yes, one more time, we're going to take that omega and we're going to substitute it in with the square root of the k over m.